I never use headphones when we do our like party rips at the park because it's just more shit that I have to deal with. People are always blown away. I'm like, we're in the same room. You can just hear me. You don't need headphones to hear me. It's different though. Well, the, you need the headphones so you know if you're too far away from the mic without telling the... I also, I speak slower when I have headphones on. You hear you hear how the audience hears it. Like a, prof, like a Dude, professional. The, the audience is listening at 2x. They're not. <laughs> not with me. I never listen to 2x. Do you listen to 2x? Do you listen to 2x? Uh, on some podcasts, not everything. I can't do it. I do. who it is. I do a humble 1.25. Humble one. Uh, do you listen to roast beef on 2x no you have to decrease the speed <laughs> have you listened to anyone else on half speed everyone sounds drunk no just roast beef yeah he sounds normal everyone sounds drunk uh hello matt odell how are you man are we are we on we're on we're on man once you put the headphones on we're on i asked you how you are you can answer you told me not to touch my mic, so I don't just touch, don't touch fucking mic. I I, uh, I couldn't I couldn't think. I just wanted to touch it. Um, I've been good. It's it's good to have you back in Nashville. Yeah, we Both love it of here. You, particularly Danny. Fuck Danny. We love it here. We like Nashville. It's my favorite place in America. I think if I was going to move one place in America, it'd be Nashville. I think I think we had consensus on mm-hmm. that, didn't we? We're ready for you. We gotta make it happen. I like Nashville. Same. It reminds me of when I first went to Austin. I'm incredibly long on Nashville and Bitcoin and Freedom Tech. And the park is going very well. Did I hear when I was in the bathroom then? They, it means you don't have to travel anymore. Everyone comes to you. Well, that's the... <laughs> yeah, uh, at, at the park, we're trying to build... Uh, I think we have 40 plus free events this year. Um, so I'm going to be doing a lot less... Uh, Bitcoin travel and more focus on on building out our events here and building out a good member experience here. And I mean, the the massive Bitcoin conference will be here next July, uh, moving from Miami. Um, so I, I don't have to go to Miami this year, which is great. That's going to be a big couple of weeks for you then. Yeah, I mean, it's insane. These These summit weeks, we have the Lightning Summit this week, is fucking ridiculous. It's exhausting. Next April, we'd like you to travel. Well, we could play that by ear. What's next April? We'd like you to come to Bedford. Is there a, is there a match? Or? There will be the final game of the season. Hopefully with us being crowned champions for the second year. And we will be hosting a little Bitcoin conference. We'd like you to come. That's pretty cool. Well, thank you for the invite. I'll consider it. Okay. Just say yes. I, this is the first time I was telling Danny this, I guess, when you were in the bathroom. This is the first time in three years that I don't have um, any Bitcoin travel on the calendar. Well, that's that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, look, it's it's a good it's, thing. It's 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 liberating. I, I mean, I, I think you you could remember uh, maybe like three years ago. Yeah, even just three years ago, there was maybe three not shitcoin conferences, like three Bitcoin conferences that mm-hmm. were really worth going to, and you would go to it, and you felt like. You know, you you met everyone you needed to meet. You had all the conversations you needed to have. And then in the last three years, there's just been this explosion of Bitcoin events. It was Honey Badger, Bitbrock Boom. Will you will you put in Miami into it as well? As the I, I would say like 2019 was their first one in San Francisco, yeah. right? Yeah, I would throw that in there. Um, do you hear something? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've just got that coming through my headphones. I wonder if it, do you remember when this happened before? And it got it happened in New York. Like radio. Yeah, it was in New York. It sounds it sounds like a news report or something, right? We're gonna go without headphones, Adele. I can't listen to that shit in the background. Well, so what were you saying? Oh. Yeah, so the three were Oh wow, this well, is the three different. the three were um for me were Miami, Bitbox Boom, and Right at the time it was San Francisco. Yeah. And then Honey Badger. And 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 since then, for for better, I think, is now there's Bitcoin conferences almost every month like every continent. And that's what we want to see. Like Bitcoin adoption is is growing. Uh, these events are distributed. Um, a lot of them have different niches that they focus on. Um, uh, like a perfect event is, is, is TabConf in Atlanta and it's a developer-focused event and they don't really have any competition on that front. And I think 
people have to kind of get it out of their mind or, I mean, people can do whatever the fuck they want, but I think it's completely ridiculous to expect to go to all of them and you pick and choose. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of Bitcoin growing up, right? You pick and choose what you want to go to. I've gotten some flack about some of our events conflicting with different dates of other people's events. It's like we're throwing 40 plus events a year. There's going to be conflicts. Please don't take it personally. You know, and at the end of the day, what we're doing at the park is very intimate 200 person events. Um, you know, I, I, if, if you're throwing a 2000 person event, I don't really consider that competition. It's a complete, it's apples and oranges experience. It's a completely different uh, vibe that we're going for. Uh, Prague was very good. Prague. I've never been, I've, the Prague, the city's awesome. The, BTC Prague was the first year. They did a really yeah. good job. I've really, only heard good really things. good job. Yeah. I was bummed to miss that one. I had pretty solid personal reasons not to make that. I uh, I always have to miss Bitch Block Boom because it always clashes with when I take my kids on holiday in the summer, which is a shame because I know Gary does a great job. I've been to one day once and I hate missing that. Uh, yeah, I think I went to four years in a row of Bit Block Boom. Yeah. And unfortunately, this will be the yeah the first year in five years, so I'm not going to be there. I'll go to Lugano. I've, I've, That's good. I've had the pleasure of being invited, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it last year and I probably will not be going this year. The other thing, like... I like the ability to reserve my right to just FOMO in last minute rather than having it on my calendar like six months ahead of time. And also, I remember when I was, you know, uh, it was really weird. My trajectory in Bitcoin was like a really zero to one. I was like in a non pleb with many different NIM handles and whatnot. And then the podcast just really took off. Um, rabbit hole recap really took off and then i just started speaking at all these events there's a novelty that would be nice to just fomo into an event like buy my ticket like not tell the organizer i'm going to be there and just like be at the fucking event you know not be on stage i think there's something to be said about that i yeah. haven't done that in four years they also look they get a bit same if you're going to all of them yeah you, you go it's to the, the same, people, same people same conversations yeah and when you've got a podcast you get to have those conversations all the time so you know when there's a talk on most of the time you think well i've already spoken to that person had that conversation with them and and so it becomes more about the hanging out afterwards but well it's good you brought up the podcast because i mean we've seen the same thing happen with the podcast right when you started your show when we started rabbit hole recap there weren't that many bitcoin shows um, now there's thousands of Bitcoin shows mm -hmm. and a bunch of them are in different niches and you kind of need to change it up. Like, I mean, I, we all remember the early Bitcoin podcast where every podcast just started off with, Oh, hi, I'm Pete. Like, what is your Bitcoin journey? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then they would just say their story about how they got into Bitcoin or whatever. Like you need to change it up and you need to keep it interesting. And then the, the expectation isn't that people are going to listen to every Bitcoin podcast. Like that doesn't make any sense anymore. Do you, I don't actually listen to it. Well, very, very occasionally, like if there's a, like we had Balaji, but then Marty dropped one. I was like, well, we should listen to that. And uh, I listened to the Balaji one. Yeah, but I don't I thought really. it was pretty funny, like three hours in, he was like, really the only takeaway your audience should have here is that they should stay on Bullstack Sats. I was like, why didn't you just tell me this before I started listening? I was like, I got that part on, on dial already, you know? You um, own that. You own that, man. When I first started podcasting, I listen to every one of my own shows and your I, own shows. Th that's the number one recommendation I would give to someone who's starting is listen to your own shows. Cause you learn that's, that's, that's how you learn what your crutches are, what you're doing wrong, improve yourself. And if you're expecting other people to listen to it, the least you could do is listen to it yourself. Um, huh? I've never, I can't listen to my shows. I never have. Yeah. See, there, my, there my biggest go. advice Case is in point. don't listen to the, yeah, come on, man. If you want to go there, we can go there. I would say don't listen to the to your competitors in the same sector, like Why? the competitor set, because you will I think you're naturally you'll listen to what they're doing and you're being drawn to them. Listen to good I think, interviewers. I think if you're starting, listen to everything, including yourself. Listen to Larry King and listen to Rogan. I think it changes if you've been doing it for a while. That's that makes sense. But in the beginning, I I think for most it, it worked for me. Listen to everybody. Huh. including yourself. Um, I would actually disagree with myself you when I was listen to listening. Yourself as a guest or you'd listen to yourself hosting? Both. Hmm. I would listen to every Rabbit Hole Recap. Like I would, I would, and the funny thing is like Rabbit Hole Recap is not edited. It's a live show. We just fucking publish. 
So it wasn't like I was listening to produce it or edit it or anything. I was just listening to see, you know, how it went. I would also say practice doing interviews without any questions in front of you. If you're going to do one. Yeah. I mean, I just never did it with. You've never, ever had questions prepped. No. Huh. I just wing it. <laughs> I wing it on live shows. Same with Civil Dispatch. Just, And also all the, it drives people crazy, uh, conference panels when I'm the moderator. They're like, oh, Matt, like, can we get on the call ahead of time and like talk about what we're going to talk about? It's like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be good. Oh, we, we can have well, a good conversation. <laughs> no, I mean, I say no to that anyway. We had, were you were there in New York? Yeah, what? yeah. Yeah, so we had one in New York and... Oh, what conference remember? was it? It begins with an S. It was a Scaramucci's. Yeah, it was. Um, it's not Scaramucci, is it? What's his name? Oh, I know. It, it's Salt, right? Salt, that's it, yeah. Wait, it was, it's Scaramucci. Is the Scaramucci a character in the film? No, no, no. Scaramucci, Anthony Scaramucci, and he's got salt, the salt conference. Yeah. It's like so, a shitcoin event. Yeah. So anyway, they uh, we turned up and they were, they were like... Uh, it's the Mooch, the guy who yeah. worked for Trump for 14 days before getting fired. They wanted us to ask, they, 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 what questions are you going to put? And I told them, and they were, they were saying to me, well, can we have some more crypto questions? I was like, no, it's going to just be Bitcoin only. And they're like, yeah, but we need some crypto questions. Exactly. I was like, no, it's going to be Bitcoin only. They fucking pulled me. You see, that's why you don't give them a heads up. Yeah, they pulled me. It's like, so we but that's one thing I've learned putting on the open source stage for Bitcoin Magazine three years in a row. And now what we're doing here in Nashville at Bitcoin Park is that people do want to get their email intro with their panelists so that they can plan ahead of time and whatnot. And that was just never my style. No, don't do that. Uh, but yeah, Bitcoin Park, amazing. I love it. And the fact that it comes to you is a good thing. The fact that you don't have to travel so much because the travel is a slog. Let's be honest. Yeah, I find it a slog. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it it takes it's time, right? Like the only thing more scarce than Bitcoin is our time, and travel takes a lot of time, right? Whether it's the plane, whether it's getting to the airport, dealing with all the planning ahead of time, all that shit. Leaving your laptop on a it plane. It takes time. Changing time zones always fucks with me. And like personal travel, I always like doing the longer trips. And in the beginning of the conference circuit or whatever, it was always like I would try and create a longer trip out of it. And then it got to the point where it was just like fly in, fly out, fly in, fly out, you know, and it's just draining. I figured it out on a plane on the last trip because everything's from Australia. So minimum it's like 14 hours. Right. Yeah, I, I reckon fucked. it's like 20 days a year I spend either in an airport. That's or insane. It's crazy. Yeah, That's I mean, why I just moved to Nashville. Yeah. There, was that, there was that year I did 90, 92 flights and I sat down and worked out how much time I actually spent in the air and it was something like three weeks. The uh, other thing I like about Nashville is that we're very centrally located and I, I prefer driving if I, can per, if I can pull off a drive. Yeah, it's not as easy here in the US. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, we have pretty good freeway systems if you're willing to... Not being in California. Yeah, not California, but like Chicago is like what, like four and a half hour drive. I mean, I like it here. I think if I could do a four and a half hour drive to Chicago versus uh, maybe it's a little bit longer, maybe it's six hours. If I could do like a six hour drive versus a fifty minute flight, I would take the six hour drive. How how big is the community here in Nashville? We're growing. We're growing pretty strong. Our monthly meetup. We have two monthly meetups that are free to the public that we've been running. Um, well, one is the social, which we've been running for, it's going to be two years in September. So a little bit less than two years. Um, that is a topical meetup. We have different topics every month. Every year is supposed to be the same topic that month. So like July will always be lightning. January will always be mining. Um, and we get, uh, on average, like 200 people for those. Nice. Um, in the bull market, it was like 250. And like the bottom of the bear when we were at like 15K, it was like 160 or something. But so like good. we average in there pretty strong in a bear market and recession. And then we added another meetup, which is the day before that, which is our bit devs, which is modeled after New York bit devs, which is a technical meetup, uh, mostly focused on developers, like the latest in developer news for the month. That one, we average like 70 people. You, have you got people flying in and coming to, coming to do both? We have people flying in and driving nice. in. Um, but a very strong local community. And a lot of people are moving here. I mean, we have very good tax taxes, like no income tax on the state level. Um, and uh, property is is not as expensive as other places in the country. Cost of living is much cheaper. If we had a studio in the US, it would be here, without doubt. There you go. 
I mean, it's gone from a place I think I first came to what? I didn't come for the first kind of three years of doing the pod. I think we, you know, like the fourth year maybe we came. And now it's what, three times in the last year? Yeah. It's growing. And uh, interestingly, it's, it's flipped Austin in terms of access to guests. Because we think of locations, access yeah. to guests. If we go to a location, how many people in that location are we going to get? And how many can we fly in like close? And then how many fly in far, right? Nashville's now flipped Austin. We're doing Nashville and Austin on this trip, and Austin's a bit harder. There's no one booked for Austin yet. <laughs> I thought there was. I don't think so. Not got anyone confirmed. Well, you just have Danny handle that for you, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what happens if you get a blue check, you get a team. I will say uh, we have very strong ties with the Austin community. The Austin Bitcoin community is very strong. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the advantages of Nashville is that we have a really easy flight between the two cities. Yeah. Um, Early Southwest in the morning. runs them all day. Oh. There's like, I think Southwest is like five or six flights. I um, fucking hate Southwest. Yeah, but they're cheap. They like get the job done. It's like an hour and 20 minutes. Super easy flight. We're flying American. It's like oh, a 6.50 in the morning flight. Well, should have considered Southwest. I fucking hate Southwest. <laughs> uh, Austin, uh, we like Austin because it's got that whole blue check scene going on. Yeah, Austin is um, a little bit blue check captured yeah. over there. A bit more credible. Yeah. They're blue checks. Where's my blue check hat, man? Fuck's sake. So Peter's upset because I brought Danny a... Uh, no bugs, no pod, no blue check hat. Because you should be wearing it. I'll you should be wearing it. Danny, Danny doesn't have a blue check, but you have a blue check, and blue checks aren't allowed to wear the hat because that would be hypocritical. Uh, I want the blue check hat, the actual pr- blue check and proud hat. Yeah, I mean, do we, should we talk about my issues with the blue check? Let's talk about your issues with the blue check. Did you have an issue with the blue check pre-pay for blue check? I think most people had an issue with the blue check before anyone could get the blue check. Okay. No one liked those blue checks, no I matter did. what. Let me tell you the, the privilege that came with that blue check that was useful. <laughs> the privilege that came. No, because there was something useful about you're it. Pre, you're pre-Elon blue check. Yeah, I'm pre. I'm like OG blue check. Okay. I got I got a blue check for, for my status. <laughs> okay. Now, listen, there were two things that were really helpful with the blue check. First one was scammers. Right. As soon as I got my blue check... I didn't get any more fake profiles. They still scam. have those accounts, even if you have a blue check. It just, you, I know they exist not because I'm searching for them, because people get in touch and say, is this you? I feel yeah. like I had it today on Instagram. People get in touch. Is this you? Is, you know, that just stopped when you had a blue check. I just didn't have I don't think that. that is true, but I, I understand. Stopped, they stopped contacting from me. From your experience. Yeah, yeah. People, people would stop contacting me and saying, is this you? They, they knew which one it was. But actually, where it was really useful is when people followed you and you had a blue check follow you, you're like, oh, who is that? And you go and check them out and it'd be like, Oh, that's so and so, and then you would message them and say, "Hey, let's talk," and you just, like open up a discussion and start. It was a class status thing. Yeah, I mean, it was just like you're a, like, "Oh, I care because this person has a blue check." It's not because I care because they have the blue check. It's like, "Oh, who are they?" I'd never heard. They of must you. be someone important. Yeah, they have they've a done blue something. Check. It's a journalist yeah. or something, and you can get in touch. A and lot they, of journalists had blue checks. Yeah, and it, that that was kind of useful. That was yeah. kind of useful. The but, journalists loved their blue checks. But when when it, when it went, I didn't even keep it. I didn't care. I didn't pay for it until the point where I was starting to see these long tweets where people are doing ones. And you like, wanted the long tweets. I did. I, there was things I wanted to put out yeah. that I, wanted, I was like, okay, I'll pay for this. And then there's the edit and all the other things. I was like, this is worth paying for. But at the time, I didn't actually know that it gave you a privileged position in the order of the replies. And I didn't know it gave you an elevated I mean, it literally promotion. says that. On, it's yeah, like I, the top level bullet point. You see right my back. read that stuff? Okay, so let's, let's just unpack this for a second. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I always had a problem. Uh, I had a problem with the blue checks because they would like talk down to people that had no checks uh, and they thought they were better than you. And you're just like, you're just some dumb journo. But that's uh, a, that's a, a fucking bit, check. That's One a bit second. generalist. Well, that's a bit generalist. I, uh, that's not where my issue lies. I will say that I was offered a blue check during those that period and I denied the blue check. I did not want the blue check then. I've been very consistent with it. But my issue with the current blue check system is that it's not the payment, it's the identity verification. It's the idea of verifying the identity of every Twitter user in order to use the platform. Twitter is a very powerful platform. It's a platform that I've used for years. Um, And I made certain, you know, my actions speak louder than my words. 
I did not, I haven't used any social media for 10 years except for Twitter. I made the exception for Twitter because it felt like a platform that everyone had a voice, that you had really open discussion. Um, and yes, was the previous regime horrible with censorship? Were they horrible with shadow bans? 100%. Um, and I took major issue with that. But now, under the new leadership, the plan is to move everyone into identity verification. And right now, the identity verification is a credit card payment and a phone number verification. And he actively blocks any of those digital burner numbers. You can still go and get like a prepaid cash burner. You can still buy a prepaid Visa card and use that. But most people are using credit cards attached to their name. They're using the same phone number that they've used their whole life. Um, and I have a feeling he's going to increase the identity verification requirements over time. And the plan is essentially, let's make it so every Twitter user is identity verified. And the soft way of doing that, rather than saying all of you need to get identity verified, is we'll give you longer tweets, we'll give you longer videos. And then the really dark part, which is what you highlighted, is essentially we will shadow ban anyone who does not verify their identity. And he doesn't say that. What he says is if you have a blue check, you're at the top of the comments, you're at the top of the algo. My whole feed is just now is just blue checks. Like all I see is blue checks there just pushed in front of my face. Um, and essentially what, what that does in practice is it shadow bans anyone who doesn't verify their identity. Mm -hmm. Now, it's incredibly clever how he's done it. Like the fact that he added the payment element to it becomes a shield because we have that saying that everyone always likes repeating. It's like, if you don't pay for a product, you are the product. So everyone proudly goes and pays for their blue check. And they're like, I'm no longer the product anymore. But they're even a greater, more valuable product than the people that don't verify their identity because he knows exactly who you are. He knows you're not a bot. Um, and he has you, and he still serves you ads. Like there's a reason you don't have ad-free experience when you pay. It's because he knows you're an even better product to advertisers because he has more data on you than someone who doesn't verify their identity. So I see this trend happening and it's mostly not speculation. People are like, oh, you're speculating this. Like Elon has just straight up said it in interviews. Mm -hmm. Before he bought Twitter, he said, my plan is to authenticate all humans. Um, like this is, this is the trend we're going in. It is a very dark dystopian timeline. And I'm very disappointed with, there are, there are so many people I respect that have just lined up and just fucking did it. And they just, they signed up for the blue check. They identified, they verified their identity. Um, and it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting case study because Bitcoiners like to talk about CBDCs all the time. We like to talk about freedom. Um, we like to talk about like resisting tyranny, uh, individual empowerment. And you kind of see what what happens when you try and roll out a, a digital panopticon, when you try and roll out a, a, a global digital identity um, where you add soft incentives and then you get people to buy in so that they they defend it with excuses and cope. So what's your what's Marty's argument? in defense of him doing well, his original argument was that he thought he was signing up to TF, the TFTC account and he wasn't doing it under his personal account. It was an accident. Um, within a week or two, that narrative changed. And now he says he's, he's on the inside and he's, he's trying <laughs> to help us out and he's reporting back. Um, but I mean, I saw, uh, so what did Elon do relatively recently? He closed off the API he made it so you couldn't view tweets without signing in. He's rolled back that That's little annoying. aspect. Yeah. But he's probably going to reenact that. His servers were just getting too overloaded. But he 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 blocked it so you couldn't view Twitter unless you logged in. Um, and he made it so that if you didn't have a blue check, if you didn't verify your identity, you could only view 600 tweets. And then it was 800 tweets. And now I think it's 1,000 tweets. Um, and all the blue checks, they were like retweeting this video of another blue check who was like, Elon's doing this to protect us from the deep state and DARPA and stuff. Like the amount of cope that happens once you buy into a system is fucking crazy. And we're going to see this exact same, all these exact same excuses happen with the CBDC. Most of these blue checks will pay for their blue check with the CBDC probably. And they'll have a bunch of different excuses for why they made that decision. But, you know, for... <sighs> It, it's it's just a really dark, and I, I don't I don't think like I'm necessarily surprised by it, but it's really dark to see it in practice, and it's dark to see so many people who who you thought might 
stand up and push back a little bit, uh, just comply with the system for sake of, of better engagement. All right. Con- convince me against having it then. Um, as someone who fully accepts that I have to give my identity everywhere, constantly bank accounts. Yeah, so you're lost already. No, but no, but but I need it for my bank accounts. Right. I have to have it. I have to give full ID. Yeah, now but, you need it for Twitter. Yeah, but but I I'm used to my identity being everywhere. I'm just I'm just talking you through right. my scenario. I'm used to my identity being everywhere. The stuff I have to do with a bank account in the UK is absolutely crazy. I have to have ID to buy Bitcoin on an exchange. Um, uh, ID for my driving license. Like I'm, I live in a world where I have to give my ID everywhere for pretty much anything I sign up by or use. Pretty much. So Twitter to me is just just another one of those, right? Right. Um. So you're going to use the CBDC? No, like you're fully captured. Well, bear with me. Like we can have the rational, honest conversation, or I can tell you what I think I should say so people don't shout at me. Okay, let's come back to that. Um, so in a world where IDs are everywhere, I have to right. use them. Like Twitter is just another service that I've signed up with my ID and I've paid for, like I have for hundreds of services online, like hundreds of services I pay for and have subscriptions to It's to me, it's just another kind of software as a service, like a retail software as a service. So like convince me why I shouldn't be using that. Well, you and get it, a hat. Huh? You get a hat for a start. <laughs> Matt wouldn't give me the hat anyway. <laughs> yeah, if any any blue checks that that, that uh, resist the check and remove the check afterwards will get a hat. But what I is just the, have to shake my hand and I have to verify that they don't have a blue check. What is the what is the mission? And I have to make a judgment call that they're not going to get the blue check post hat. Like, what is it you're worried about in <laughs> in this instance? What is the resistance? Because, yeah, do you see it as? A sinister act by Elon, or do you see it yes. as somebody? Well, bear with me. Or do you see it as somebody who spent forty-four billion accidentally on a platform he didn't really want to buy, and then got trapped into buying, and now has to try and monetize it? And he's he's now found a way to monetize it in a way that you would maybe see as sinister, and has potential sinister repercussions down the line. Well, to be clear here, when we say he's he's found a way to monetize it, it's not the eight dollars a month. It's getting everyone to verify their identity so he has more expensive data to sell on them. Yeah, but like what I'm saying right, is... But you really, like, because that's the genius of it. Yeah. Everyone is talking about how he's got this revolutionary new business model of the $8 per month. That's not the business model. The business model is verify everyone's fucking identity so his ad sales are, are significantly more lucrative um, and that he, all of his data... All the data he has becomes significantly more lucrative as we start to enter this world of AI and more bots and whatnot. But but that is, in some ways, just business. That is the business of online platforms. It's surveillance that, capitalism. Yeah, surveillance capitalism, yeah. of which some people are happy to sign up to surveillance capitalism, well, here's the thing. share their data and get a platform for free. If, if, you're, if you're fine using TikTok and you're fine with using Facebook that are, are have historically been very surveillance capitalism focused and like Twitter wasn't immune to it. Obviously Twitter had its own elements of surveillance capitalism, but we saw with Facebook, they moved to real names very quickly, very early on, right? They were trying to make more safe, quote unquote, safe local spaces that people felt more comfortable, less NIMS. They had really not as many NIM folk. They were like block people's accounts that they had NIMS and whatnot. Um, TikTok, everyone knows TikTok is a Chinese surveillance app. Everyone knows WeChat is a Chinese surveillance app, right? And Elon has decided that he wants Twitter to be WeChat of America. He literally has said that. Mm -hmm. He wants to integrate payments. He wants your whole life to revolve around Twitter and have your verified identity there and have complete control over that system. Now, so if you're fine with those others, then... I mean, I, it logically follows that you'd be fine with Twitter moving to identity verified model. Now, I would say that we've never been in this situation in humanity. We've never had so much of our lives digital. We've never had so few people control those platforms um, that our lives revolve around. Um, and I think this idea of connecting your identity to everything you do on the internet is extremely dangerous. And I just don't think we've seen the repercussions yet. And I think people see the repercussions down the line later on. And I'm not trying to be, um, it's fun to shit on blue checks. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not trying to be, you know, a, a necessarily a negative person. I think there is hope at the end of the tunnel. I think the hope is freedom tech. I think, 
I think Noster, for example, is a very compelling protocol. It's this open communication protocol that's interoperable, that's permissionless, that anyone can build clients for, that you control your, your network graph. So like you can, if you're using one app, and that app decides to censor you, you can just take your private key and move to another app and continue using Noster. Uh, it can be used for all different kinds of communication, even larger than social media itself, but like it can also be used to, um, as, as essentially a, a Twitter competitor or an Instagram competitor or a Reddit competitor. And I think that is hope because you don't have an individual or a company or a government controlling it. Because at the end of the day, what Snowden showed us is it doesn't really matter if it's a company controlling it, they're gonna be complicit with government actions mm -hmm. in the future as well. So that's the fear is down the road, I don't know, there's uh, Tur let's use Turkey as an example because uh, Elon bent the knee to the Turkish government. There are activists, anti-government activists, and the Turkish government, Erdogan says, can you please give me the identities of these people. Right. I mean, that's the extreme example. And like, we just saw Elon say on Twitter that he's going to protect Anons. And he was oh. responding to a NIM blue check account who has verified his identity. So Elon knows the identity of that blue check. Unless they did it with um, anonymous Yeah, well, for, I think that is mostly a cop out because I think most people are not doing that. 99% um, of people aren't doing that. And I think that it will become much more difficult for people to do that in the future because he's going to increase. What's going to happen is he's going to use the excuse that bots are getting blue checks and I need to increase the verification to protect you all. And most of the blue checks be like, oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course. And they'll just go along with it. It's the frog boiling in the mm. pot, so to speak, right? It's a slippery slope. So when he says he's going to protect Anons, what he means is I'm going to verify every single person's identity and then you have to trust him to protect that identifiable information. And what yeah. we've known about every single data, uh, every single amount of data, on any data on the internet will eventually get leaked, sold, or shared. That's what always happens. Yep. And you mentioned Turkey with Elon. Well, you have, let's say you have Turkish activists. And so what did Elon do? Elon censored uh, a particular opposition candidate on Twitter um, during the election in Turkey to, so that Twitter was still accessible in Turkey. Well, that same dude will undoubtedly hand over any opposition people that are verified on, on Twitter and attach anything that they said on that platform, they will attach that to your identity and they'll hand it right over to those goons. Like he'll do it in a fucking heartbeat. That is fucking dark shit. Mm -hmm. And most, and like this idea, even this whole idea of, um, like everyone knows corporate media is shit, right? But why is corporate media shit? Corporate media is shit is because it's controlled by big corporations. That's why we call it corporate media, right? Uh, they have big pharma contracts in terms of their ad revenue. They have all these different contracts. They can only say certain things and if they speak out of line, what do they lose? They lose reach and they lose revenue, right? The independent media person uh, was supposed to be the answer to that. Anyone could be an ind independent media personality or an influencer. That was supposed to be uh, the way to democratize access to news and content and media and whatnot. Most of those people rely on these centralized social platforms, including Twitter. They are building revenue streams into them and they have centralized control over whether or not you have reach or not. So if you speak out of line five years, six years, seven years on Twitter, Blue check removed, you lose your revenue stream, you lose your reach. You're in the same exact situation as corporate media. You just added Elon into the mix where Elon gets cut of the revenue as well. Um, but in practice, you end up in the same result as a host on CNN or, or an anchor on Fox. You're in the same exact situation. And he's, he's trying to get the content creators and the independent media personalities even more bought into it. Like he has this idea where uh, you content creator uh, podcast host, uh, post your video. You, you release your video directly on Twitter. You verified your identity. People verified their identity underneath you. They reply to your post and they're doing all these replies. Then he inserts ads in there and then you get a cut of the ad revenue. He's already said this publicly. This is his plan. You get a cut of the ad revenue of the ads that people see underneath your comments until you act out of line. Then you get none of that. And, and, a lot of the blue check influencers will in a heartbeat do whatever he says 
to make sure that they, they get back in there. Why do you think there's uh, so much cope and so little pushback on Elon? Why? Because I think there's plenty of evidence that he's somebody who uh, can't be trusted. I think there's plenty of evidence that he's shown he's willing to censor people. Uh, he's very happy to bend the knee to Chinese government or any government where he maybe has a rocket deal. Um, he is, uh, I, th- I heard him referred to as a free speech opportunist. Yeah. Where he's constantly talking about free speech. Uh, I, my own experience, every, any time I post a tweet that's tw- Twitter, uh, Twitter, critical, um, all my replies, well, not all of them, a lot of replies are like simping for Elon, right? yelling at me. Yeah. I mean, saying, I what have you done? I was like, yeah. so why, why do you think people have failed to be so, uh, to operate from a, a principles with Elon? Why does he if get some pass? If you care about your audience on Twitter, it is fucking scary to talk shit about Elon and current Twitter leadership on Twitter or anything that might be counter to the current Twitter regime. It was the same way uh, pre-Elon in a lot of ways, different different things you couldn't say or different things you'd be worried about saying. But people uh, self-censor themselves to protect that, that reach, to protect that platform. And the only reason I am comfortable... I mean, one of the main one of the main things that empowers me is that I'm completely I've come to terms with the fact that, you know, my 200,000 followers or whatever on Twitter, I could just lose access to them tomorrow. Like I, if he reads a tweet the wrong way, who the fuck knows? Has he done that to anyone? Do we know directly? Well, yeah, for criticizing him. I don't know if it's for criticizing him. Well, we know one thing that in 2018 there was a uh there was a, a Tesla critic that was an anon. I think he was called Minnesota skeptic or something like that on Twitter. And someone doxed him. And obviously Elon didn't own Twitter yet at that point. And Elon Karen called his employer and complained that, that one of their employees was uh, talking shit about Tesla. Was that what that tweet was about? That an anon no, one. that was about something else. That was just yeah. But did you see what it said? Yeah, it was. It get was. I'm an anon because you're just gonna get me. Fired. Karen called my boss and get me fired. Get me fired. Yeah. Did you see what Jordan Peterson said to that? Yeah, I mean Jordan is just incredibly wrong on this, and yeah. it's uh, really it's really sad to see. Uh, but there's a lot of influencers that are also just completely wrong, in my opinion. So what should we? Um, what, what like just just cancel? Should I do it now? I mean, you're not going to cancel your blue check. Um, Hold on, I'm going to cancel this. Look, I think civil disobedience is important. And I think at the very least, people should, you know, not comply with it. I think if if Elon saw that, the thing is, is like, the big lie is that, you know, you don't, there are however many millions of Twitter users, right? But there is a, there is a core... 5,000 that he really cares about, right? That are the ones that are actually, they use Twitter as their main medium. They are posting all this content. And then most of the people are consumers, right? They're Mm -hmm. consuming that content that gets created. And over the, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but like over those 5,000 or 10,000, like 95, 98%, just like identity verified, boom, done. There was no pushback. um, Among a lot of people that are so-called freedom-oriented, I'll never do the CBDC, I'll never do all this stuff. Um, They just straight up, as soon as they got offered it, they just complied. They verified their phone number, they paid with credit card. Yeah, I mean, Uh, I did. I didn't think it through at all. I was like, totally fine with it. Uh, Interestingly, because I just did go to look to cancel. And I think think the real productive thing is to use Nostra more, right? Nostra is still very early. Um, I think it's very, I'm very hopeful and optimistic for it. So listen to this. It says, looks like you bought this subscription on the Twitter website. You'll need to manage or cancel your subscription on that platform. A bit strange that it, it's not cross-platform like that. It might be like a weird Apple rule where you have to... Yeah, it's because it. if you do it through uh, Apple, you have right. to pay 30% or whatever, so you have to do an on I left my laptop on the plane. <laughs> yeah, it's because Apple takes a 30% cut otherwise. But And I think, I think what he does is if you buy it through Apple, he charges you 30% more, so he still gets the same amount. Huh. Um, so you have, a, you have an incentive to sign up outside of Apple. Do you, um, but but do you you think about this all day every day? This is who you are, Matt. This is your 
I, don't I mean, say, not really. I no, bear, bear with me. I, I'm not saying it's your brand. Are the blue checks in the room? No, no, no. Right no, no. Now, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean <laughs> you think about blue checks all day, every day. And I don't, when I say your brand, I don't mean that as like, oh, this is who you're trying to, like, you're trying to be some brand. But I mean, you think about freedom tech. You think about privacy. You think about this a lot, right? So when it comes up, you take a step back and think it through. Whereas I don't. I'm, I'm not naturally like that. Yeah. I see, oh, cool. There's a 4,000 character tweet. I'm I'm hit my limit. I'm, I want to send that. I want to be able to edit my tweets. Yeah, I'll sign up. Here's my. I don't. I didn't think it through to that level. So, if I'm not thinking about it to that level, well, that's why I talk about most it. Most people aren't. Well, so one thing you did that was I do appreciate is uh, you got very defensive about my blue check tweets. Uh, so you would usually respond to them, yeah, which was really nice. You gave me your blue check engagement well, boost. My, my boy. Uh, so I, I do appreciate that. Most blue checks will just ignore it. And so like, I just, the tweet just dies in a corner. Um, and then people always say like, oh, like, you know, if you hate Twitter so much, why do you use it? Well, it's like, I got this fucking audience on Twitter. Everyone's on Twitter. Like, that's why I'm disappointed is because Twitter is moving to a more closed platform. So of course I'm going to talk about it on Twitter. That's where everyone that's affected by this is already because it's fucking Twitter closing the doors. Um, but look, you have a decent amount of reach. I think you talking about the dangers of identity verification across the digital landscape would bring a lot of value to people. It's one of the reasons I come on your show all the time. Um, because you have to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. Um, but so should I keep my blue check wait, so I get more look, people to you listen have to, to this? make you have to make a personal decision yeah you have to make a personal decision but I think you know if 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 this should like freedom dies by just people just taking a little bit more and 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 then we just end up in a situation where people are like how the fuck did we end up here and at some point in the line, you have to practice civil disobedience and you have to say, no, I will not fucking comply. And I think COVID taught that for a lot of people. But then at the same time, a lot of those people then went and just verified their identity right away. And it's a different technique, right? And I think Elon is, is a very good operator in that regard. He knows exactly what to say. He knows exactly how to virtue signal. And the point here is it's way bigger than me or you. You know, it's it's the Joe Rogans of the world that complied with the blue check and 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 continue to leverage the platform. It's the Tim Pools, it's the Glenn Greenwalds. It's Snowden has a blue check. Right? These people have millions of followers. They completely dwarf our shows and listeners. And they have just gone ahead and they've complied with it. And what you've noticed is they will also make up excuses for why they did it. They will make up excuses for why Elon does something. Oh, we're just, we're misinterpreting it. We're doing it this or that. And it's a, it's a coping mechanism for their decision. Um, but we had Tucker Carlson, right? Tucker Carlson did it. He but, left but, Fox. He, well, he was fired by Fox. Okay. Okay. And then son, see, this, this is another like cope that I don't understand. Is but the, well, bear with me. Tucker Carlson quits and suddenly has this revelation about the media. Like, I know, I agree. You were fucking fired. And the next day you're on Twitter giving a speech about how we've been lied Look, to. Like, you, as long as you were happy to be paid, it's fucking know, bullshit. We all know the influencer game is mostly a LARP and a show. Mm -hmm. And you tell people what they want to hear. Um, that is how influencer set, incentives are set up. There's a reason why the independent media concept didn't stop misinformation. If anything, it increased misinformation because misinformation can be very provocative. You'll get very good engagement. Most people can't beat you to the punch on it because you just fucking made it up. So like, how can they report on it before you? And as a result, if you follow those incentives, we've ended up in a situation where a lot of influencers just act completely unethically, unethically and then they get rewarded for that. They do better in that situation. Someone talk, taking a more nuanced, accurate point of view is going to get way less reach across any platform. Now, I don't think Noster necessarily fixes that, but it's something that people should be aware of. But my point is, is for better or for worse, Tucker's brand is a freedom-oriented brand. People look to him for freedom-oriented content. They believe of him as a freedom-oriented figure. 
And he's done more than just comply with the new blue check program. He has made it a core part of his brand. I, you know, he got fired from Fox. I left Fox and now I'm Twitter only posting my long form videos here with my nice, you know, identity verified blue check. And it's going to, it's good. The thing is, is like, I don't expect to convince most people, but it will become more obvious over time. Like as the trend continues, it will become more obvious. When we when we saw him make the rush decision of close the API and close off the access and rate limit or whatever, there was a lot of people that reached out. They're like, fuck, man, you were right. Well, that's going to happen over and over and over again. And if you seed the thought, it will happen quicker for people, in my opinion. If you seed the thought, if you if you if you bring it to people's attention ahead of time, as it starts to unfold and get worse people will connect the two dots quicker. Um, and that's kind of my hope. But I just think more people should talk about it. Like it is it is scary. It is fucking dark. It is a really bad trend. And like another thing, I'm just going on and on. Do but it, keep there's coming. A, like someone responded to me, it's like, oh, Odell, like this is super easy for you to say, like you have 200,000 followers. Like I'm just trying to make my account now. And like, I'm trying to get, you know, a little bit of reach for my content. And like, so I'm, I'm going to verify my identity. It's like, yeah, that's the fucked up part <laughs> because I didn't have to. <laughs> I didn't have to verify my identity. Twitter, you know, had its own faults, but it allowed people to just come in and, 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 you know, interact with an audience and build an audience and make friends and do all this stuff without providing identity verification information. And the thing is, is verifying for the blue check doesn't even give you increased reach. It just effectively shadow bans everyone who's not doing it. But if the majority of people are doing it, you're just verifying your identity to be on equal level as all the other people. And so like that, that's the fucked up part. That's like, when I see a comment like that, it's like, that is exactly why it's so fucked up because you're essentially new content creator comes in, new independent media person comes in, just average Joe comes in and they want a decent Twitter experience, they have to verify their identity. I'm going to get rid of my blue check, mark. Well, I would respect that if you did. The hard thing is as well, like you're preaching to a pretty receptive choir. Like these, this is Bitcoin and like people are willing to hear these kind of arguments. Like in the real world, I don't think anyone even understands this as an issue. I think a lot of people realize TikTok is a problem. Yeah, I think so. But that's only because it's China. I, yeah, mostly because it's China. So, a, a smaller subset realize Facebook is a problem. Yeah. Um, some people realize PayPal is a problem, mostly because they've either gotten censored themselves or they know someone who had their wallet frozen. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think, but that's why I'm even more disappointed mm. because it hasn't been that receptive in this audience. You can't even get the Bitcoiners. Um, yeah, I mean, fucking my brother Marty did it, mm. right? Like, there's, there, like, that is, that is what. Uh, concerns me the most because it happened so fucking quickly and so many more people complied th than I expected to. But I think the average person will start to realize the dangers. Like as it's, it's my same like doomer optimism I have for Bitcoin, like broader freedom tech movement is that like people are just going to get burned to the point where they'll realize the need. And then we just need to have the tools and the education ready for them when they actually want to improve their situation. Right. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people probably did it without thinking it about it to the extent that you have. I don't think it's a case of they thought, oh, well, you know, it's bad, but like I need, I need my, I need my additional reach. I think some people just didn't think it through. I swear, and when I did it, I was literally like, oh, I want to do that long tweet. Here's my, uh, here's my card details. I didn't go through the list of things, and I didn't think it through. And I think a lot of people probably did that. Well, we'll see. We'll see if there's a, <laughs> but we're a, a lingering revolt to the identity verification program. Uh, but I don't think there will be. And in fact, oh, I've seen the opposite. I've seen people dig their heels in to defend their decision. And uh, I don't think it's going to change. It's particularly among the influencer class. The influencer class is completely captured by the centralized platforms that they rely on. Like I'm, I'm sure you guys have thought about it. Like what happens if I wake up tomorrow? And, and, and we're off of Twitter, we're, we're banned from Twitter or like I saw, you know, I've consulted for many companies in the space, but like Bitcoin magazine gets cut from YouTube, right? Like that's a serious hit to your business, of course. right? And so as a result, people end up making decisions based on protecting 
the protecting their access to those centralized platforms. C- can we honestly say, and we should be honest, say we've ever made any decision where we thought we better not do that in case we get banned? No. We've got one warning on YouTube. I can't remember. But that was for an was. ad. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was for a gambling ad. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, no, I really don't think we have. Like, genuinely, I don't think But we're we not that risque. Yeah. Marty right? doesn't post certain things to YouTube. Yeah, we're not that risque. Like, we've come close. Uh, I say we, but, like, he has a TFTC YouTube account. He owns TFTC. We're 50% partners in Rabbit Hole Recap. Rabbit Hole Recap uses the TFTC YouTube account. Um. But the TFTC YouTube account has gotten to like the two of three strikes where it's like been very close. And he's intentionally not posted certain things uh, to YouTube. Uh, that's he's so censored himself. Now, like I just, I will say podcasting as a medium is fortunately still very resilient. Um Spotify could ban you. And that's why it's been very dangerous watching Spotify try and capture the whole stack like they do with Rogan, where they have them completely in-house. You can only listen to Spotify. But this idea of the open RSS feed, um, like maybe whoever hosts your RSS feed could censor you, but then you can move to a different RSS feed. Listeners can listen from thousands of different podcast apps. Um, But uh, if you look at people that are text-based, we've seen massive censorship on Medium, on Substack. Substack was bo- born out of the Medium censorship, but then we've even seen censorship on Substack. Then all of a sudden, Ghost comes into the picture, and Ghost lets you self-host, so you don't have to deal with that as much. Um, I mean, we saw Twitter start blocking Substack links on Twitter or whatever. So this is something that like the influencer class... Most of the influencer class is thinking about on a daily basis. They're thinking, how do I maintain access to these centralized platforms that are essentially paying my rent and paying for all my travel and paying for all this other shit? Um, And as a result, they're self-censoring across the board. And then sometimes it takes an even step further where they're not self-censoring, but they just get fucking removed from the platform. And then that's that. You All all of a sudden, you lose all your YouTube revenue. You lose all your YouTube... uh, subscribers or whatever. At least you have a channel that has a million YouTube subscribers and you lose that tomorrow, all of a sudden, you know, you want to do revenue projections for the next year, like you just fucking got wrecked. Yeah, and that two or three strikes is is a strange position to be in because it's not like, oh, if you're a good boy for the for the year that they reset you. At any moment now, one mistake in the I think eyes they of YouTube. Do, do some kind of reset system. Do they? I don't know. The problem is most of these policies are very vague. And but the real core of the problem is is that these platforms are controlled by centralized entities. And those centralized entities are almost always complicit with whatever governments are providing them safe harbor, whether that's America or China. Um, and they are complicit to their shareholders if they're a publicly, if they're a publicly traded company or they're complicit to their private ownership, even if they're a private company, right? And if you, if you see like the ownership structure of, you know, like, like BlackRock owns, you know, is like probably the biggest shareholder of Google. Like I haven't looked it up, but they're the biggest shareholder of pretty much everything. And then the second biggest shareholder is Vanguard and they're the biggest shareholder of, uh, BlackRock's the biggest shareholder of Vanguard. So it's like, it's the same people are controlling everything. And then you just have this, this really small group of very powerful people. And then you have this influencer, influencer class below it that gives this appearance of distribution Right, like, oh, we have all this distributed media, but they're all subservient to to their rulers that are 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 gifting them access to these platforms and can take it away from you at will. Super fucking dark. Hmm. Um, Danny mentioned it. It's one of the things that I wrote down before we started. Is that in the world we live in, we have a, an audience that's slightly receptive to this, these ideas, these right. risks, but it's a very small group of people in the grand scheme of things trying to yeah i always use the example if i was down the pub with my mates it's a great example because i host a a bitcoin podcast it's one of the larger ones and so if anyone should know about bitcoin or be receptive to it it should be my friends but when i sit down they don't give a fuck i mean like they they know i do it as my job they know it's been good for me they know i've now got a football team they know i've now got a barn i still want to try and talk to them about bitcoin or money matters i'm you know having my bank accounts closed down they're like yeah whatever I've still got my bank account. They don't care. If I start talking about social media platforms and the risk of censorship and ID verification, again, they're just not going to care. And so 
Uh, what I've been trying to do then with preparing for this matter to talk to you is about this kind of collective fight back is a very hard battle to win because creating that density of people who are going to care about what you care about to fight back is going to be very hard. But as an individual, you can at least put in place the insurance products or the insurance to protect yourself if you are removed. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why my focus is on and 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 this is why a large part of my focus is Bitcoin, but the, my, my focus is this idea of, of, of freedom tech that empowers individuals. Because if if if, if you give someone what a, a, one, what's you give someone something that is effectively a defensive tool uh, that amplifies their defensive capability. Um, the result is it significantly hurts. Uh, it's, it significantly reduces the control of a select few. And like, so, I mean, this is kind of how I see like Noster developing, right? And I think there's actually a strong incentive. And this is why I said, I don't think Noster fixes broken influencer incentives um, with misinformation and like engagement for engagement at all cost, right? Which is just dark. I, it's just really fucked up. I don't, I don't know what solves that. Um, but Noster actually provides a very strong, the reason I'm optimistic on Noster is because it's not, it's, it's not going to succeed based on altruism. It's going to succeed because influencer after influencer is going to realize if I wake up tomorrow, uh, everything I built on Twitter could be gone. Everything I built on YouTube could be gone. Everything I built on TikTok could be gone. But everything I built on Noster is, can't be stopped. And and they have a direct incentive to start trying to fucking figure it out. And that's on top of, that's besides the point of the ability to just immediately receive Bitcoin payments directly from your audience, which I think is an extremely novel content funding mechanism that people will get very excited about because Bitcoin's the best fucking money. And if I can get paid without a middleman directly from my audience for content I produce, that should be a very valuable revenue stream that can't be censored very easily. Um, but I think there's a direct incentive for just individual people that have large platforms to to start trying to figure out, you know, how how Nostra works. And Nostra's still very early. The clients, the apps are are still a little rough around the edges. It's going to get easier because there's a, another direct incentive that if you build good Nostra apps, like you can make your own revenue stream out of that, right? And so it's not based, the, the success of Bitcoin and the success of Nostr are not based on altruism. They're based on greed and selfish behavior. That's what, that, that's what makes me optimistic about them. Because if you assume benevolence, that's how you end up in all these corrupt institutions that we've built our whole society on. Because you can't assume benevolence. If there's a centralized power, it will be corrupted eventually. Just check. Jack has a blue check. Well, see, Jack is a little bit... Uh, it's a little bit different uh, because I think he, I think Elon removed his blue check because he refused to do the new blue check program, and then Elon added it back. Oh, he because it. it was really bad to have the ex founder of not have a blue check. Twitter not have a blue check. Yeah, because Jack has been um, one of the the best. Like, it's a prominent person with millions of followers, very well respected, yeah. pushing freedom tech. I mean, look, this is the thing about centralized platforms, right? Is if I make any kind of real waves, the easiest way to the, the easiest way to neuter my my commentary, if Elon pays attention, is to just bless me a blue check. Like I can't stop him from putting one there. And like no one would believe me. What I would just be like, oh no, this is ridiculous. I woke up this morning and there's a blue check. They'd be like, fuck you, Matt. You're just another fucking influencer. I'd believe right? you. Right? I'd believe you. Thank it. you, Pete. I appreciate that. But That's like a dozen saying. people would believe me. Right. And you could just fucking nip it in the bud like that if you wanted to. But that's the fucked up part is like one person, one company, governments they collude with should not have that kind of power. That is fucking crazy. And we have not seen the repercussions of that yet. We've seen soft repercussions of it. We've seen little tidbits of it, but it gets really, really, really fucking dark down the road. Do you think Elon cares about freedom? No. So, so why do so many people simp for him? He cares about money and power, and he plays an audience really well. Most people care about money and power, and that's fine. Like that's how we should build these things. We should build it with the assumption that most people care about money and power. So, after the initial excitement with Nostar, uh, it's died down a lot. A lot of the people yes. were there early on, using a lot, aren't so much. 
Yeah. Which is disappointing. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a great website called Noster.band that tracks a lot of these um, metrics. Noster is really cool because it's an open protocol. So uh, all that information is out there. Like people can analyze it however they want to analyze it. And it's not like you're trusting Twitter with daily active user numbers or whatever, right? Mm. It's like, this is the data. This is how many posts have gone out from different pub keys. These are the relays they're connected to. Um, and you can extrapolate data from that. I think Noster.band said after 30 days, there's about a 20% retention rate. So um, someone comes into Noster and 30 days later, they're still using it, which I think is actually pretty decent. Yeah. Um, but the more prominent, right? I think a lot of people, people are using it. Less. I think a lot of blue checks have one foot in, one foot out, and it's a weird chicken and egg kind of situation. Where, uh, so Noster is an interoperable communication protocol. What makes that interesting is because you can use Noster for things that are not social media. Yeah. So like you can, uh, if apps need to communicate with each other, if AI wants to communicate with each other, who knows this whole, this, I think there's going to be like a crazy AI landscape where uh, AI is paying other AI with Bitcoin and the communications with Noster. Like there's all these like crazy fucking things that we can't even comprehend. But the easy thing to comprehend is the Twitter clones and Noster is being used as essentially a Twitter competitor, a Reddit competitor, an Instagram competitor, Substack competitor. Um, and I think when it comes to that social media competition, we have seen in general, even among centralized social media, that there's very few people that successfully build audiences across multiple platforms. They usually pick and choose one. They kind of cross post to others. They almost never get the kind of engagement that they see from their primary if they're just cross posting and they're not really like natively part of that platform or whatever. I think you've noticed that. Um, and I think Noster has kind of seen those issues as an early um, social protocol, and 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 where where people, you know, maybe they'll post to Twitter and then they'll they'll cross post the same exact thing to Noster an hour later, and it's like if if the user has already seen that on Twitter, they're like, well, who, what? Are, why are you you know reposting it here? And it's just not really genuine. Um, so. Anyway, where I was going with that is I just think there's like a little bit of a chicken and egg where like we were talking earlier about how like Twitter has a subset of users that are creating the majority of content, right? And like, so new social protocol, like a, a new social network, this is bigger than a network, it's a protocol, but a new social network, like you need, you need the content creators that are dedicated to it, but then the content creators expect to have the audience that is consuming it. And it's like, which comes first? And it's, it's probably this like organic, Mm. combination of they kind of come together over time and they they become additive on top of each other and um i think i think what we'll see happen is first the two main issues that nostra's had so far is ingrained network effects of like twitter and whatnot and that's it is what it is um that will take time to to kind of combat but the second thing is the apps have just been very rough over the edges and let's be honest like the the main way people are going to use nostra as a social media protocol is going to be through their mobile apps, whether mm. that's on iPhone or Android. And those apps are way better spot than they were six months ago. In six months, they're going to be in an even better spot. Mm -hmm. I think it could be, be sooner than six months. Um, I where, think Damas is great. Yeah, Damas is great, iPhone only, right? Uh -huh. um, and so what I think is, I think these apps will get better, the clients will get better. Everything around the ecosystem is growing really fast and it's growing in this very like viral organic way. It's not like a centralized company is building this out. And the thing is when you have a centralized company doing it, um, you can really turbocharge the beginning and you can fake it with a bunch of daily active users and do all these different incentives to kind of juice those numbers like we saw with Instagram and their Twitter competitor threads. Um, but when you have an open protocol that is mostly built on top of a bunch of different open source projects, um, it's a little bit of a slow, gradual, then kind of suddenly kind of growth trajectory, but it's really hard to stop once that momentum starts building and we're watching that momentum build. So I think um, well, people will, will flock to Nostra as they recognize the need. And I think the best marketing, uh, best marketing channels is all these centralized platforms continuing to censor, um, continuing to require more and more personal identifiable information 
um, continuing to move to wall gardens. It's not just Twitter. Like Reddit just recently closed up their API. They broke a bunch of third-party clients. Um, why did Why did Reddit do that? Because because they're, they're they they they. They see a a value of of closing their data behind a paywall and requiring you to essentially pay them in order to hit their servers. Um, and some people say it's partially because of AI and people training AI. Yeah, sure. But I think that this has always been the case. Um, what is that 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 uh, phrase that people hear all the time? Like data is the new oil. Right. But a lot of times it was kind of hidden because everyone was just like supercharged on this VC money. And we were just in like a super easy money environment. Rates were super low. Tons of VC money was pouring in. Oh, we'll figure out how to make profitability later. Right. And then you, you get to this point. Money is extremely tight. It's hard to raise money. It's hard to borrow money. Rates are high. Um, meanwhile, your server costs keep going up and you start to try and make drastic measures to to pay the bills, um, and the the immediate reaction of a centralized system is let's close up the walls, let's 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 make it less open, not more open. And the difference with Nostr is Nostr is a protocol; it's not controlled by any company. So that information will always be free. People can build on the on the sides of it, on the edges of it, but the core protocol is a free and open source protocol that no one has complete, no one has control over. That data will always be open. So it's not even if you're an influencer and you're afraid of being rugged. What if you're a builder? What if you're one of these guys that's been working for eight years on a Reddit app, um, a Reddit third-party app, and then one day the Reddit CEO essentially calls you up and says, like, if you don't pay us $10,000 a month, like, you can't do it. And then he crunches the numbers. He's like, I can't be in business. If you're running a business, you don't want to get rugged by a centralized provider, right? And, and so the unfortunate reality is just it's just going to be people getting burned over and over again, and then people learning and then seeking out better alternatives. Uh, and that's the same thing with Bitcoin. It's the same thing with the greater freedom tech movement in general is how I look at it. Um, and if, if, if people with platforms, with audiences, like can... Can, can talk to their audience and explain these risks ahead of time. I don't think we avoid, you know, this dark timeline, but we can greatly lessen the impact. We can greatly lessen the pain that people feel. Um, and, and we can start building towards a brighter future today rather than, you know, waiting three decades or two decades or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, I still think it's, it's hard. Because yeah, freedom it's, it's freedom fucking take, hard, man. Yeah. Freedom's difficult. Freedom is difficult, but but that is a it is a this is not me not backing you or not agreeing with you. Just saying it is a hard sell for people to care enough to put the effort in to learn about these technologies, to learn about Bitcoin, to learn about Nostra, to go to platforms where their favorite rapper or football player is isn't and but that's but that's my point my, my point is like i respect that which is why like bitcoin should be very easy to use you just download an app yeah uh and so should nostr like nostr like they shouldn't uh, the average person is not going to understand like the intricacies of like how relay incentives work or that they're signing a message with a public key private key pair or any of this shit all they're going to know is I can install this app and I can access social media that can't be censored. And if I get censored on this app, I can take my little backup phrase and I can just put it in a different app and I'm good to go. So you And Twitter can't do that. YouTube can't do that. TikTok can't do that. Facebook can't do that. And they'll just figure that part out. They don't have to know all the intricacies. I mean, it'd be great if more and more people understand the intricacies. Like we need people building and focused on this shit. But for the overwhelming majority of people... It's just an app they install, and if if we if we don't get to that point, then we've completely failed. Like anyone who's focused on that on this movement, like has completely failed if we can't get to that point. So, so you're saying that people don't really need to know what an XPub is? Yes, but people that have a massive Bitcoin podcast should know what an XPub is. But but what if somebody <laughs> have a massive Bitcoin podcast is trying to make the point? Yeah. Well, you should still know what an XPub is. You can still act dumb if you need to for your audience. I've known what an XPub is for a very long time. 
I'm aware and I'm glad. But the point I always my try point to- is if, if you had a Noster focused podcast, you should understand all the incentives and everything that makes Noster censorship resistant. But if you're the average person, you should just know it's you know it's it's something that does the things that Twitter has done for me for years, but. Uh, there's not like five people in the boardroom that can decide if I can speak or not. Yeah, I mean, I obviously completely disagree with the point you made there. Why? Because I think it's very important to be able to talk to people like yourselves, everyone else, and say, look, everything you're expecting people to do, they're not going to do, they're not going to care, and this is why. And I've stood by that, whether it's nodes, ex-pubs, or whatever technical bullshit that sits in the background that people think you should know and say, they don't care. And I've been a hundred percent right. I've been saying that too. No, but I've been a hundred percent right the whole time. Okay, you're trying to derail me. No, no. Uh, the important part here is, fine. is that is it's easy to dismiss these tools as code, as tech projects, but ultimately these are freedom movements. These are tools that facilitate freedom movements. Movements require individuals. It's a movement of individuals. People need to stand up. People need to take action. People need to take their take their life into their own hands and and push forward. Otherwise, we're going to go down a very, very fucking dark timeline mm. that everyone's going to fucking regret. And we're going to have to build from the fucking rubble of that, which I, I prefer know. not to do. And I'm with you, but I'm, I'm, I, I keep coming back to it. It's like, ha- it's pretty cool. How do we get them there? Like, how do we get them there? How do we get people to care about this? Because you're, tr- you're, you're trying to convince them to use something that looks le- less sexy, feels less sexy, has less uh, uh, kind of social benefit or commercial benefit for them for a risk which is downstream. That's a hard sell. And I'm, again, just for the idiots listening, you're going to yell at me saying Bitcoin that. Bitcoin or Nostra. It's the same. It's, exact, it's almost the same point. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, if, if I go to my notes here, everything the government can capture, they will capture. And we've got yep. money slash property, comms slash comms channels narrative no, speech yeah speech yeah. money speech you know anything they can they will to me i see there's very little difference between nostra and bitcoin these days you know one is money one is speech but they're, they're doing exactly the same job they're they are allow they're making it censorship resistant censorship resistant money censorship resistant speech right protected by code and incentives not yeah. laws yeah because laws get corrupted yeah and and, it, and it's a hard sell for people you know i think uh I I I think the Noster side is going to be. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Um, I think the Noster side is going to be a very a much easier sell than the Bitcoin side. I agree, particularly for Americans because Americans, you know, the dollar is the best shitcoin. Um, people trust the dollar still, even though they shouldn't. Um, they trust the U.S. financial system. People were very surprised when the bank runs were happening. Um, and they've already kind of forgotten about it relatively quickly. Um, with Bitcoin, you don't you don't see that, by the way, in like an Argentina or Nigeria or somewhere where they have failed money and very horrible, f- very frictionful, inefficient uh, financial networks. Those people tend to come to Bitcoin easier than in America. Um, but I think, for better or for worse, uh, social media has completely consumed and corrupted our societies. Mm -hmm. People spend hours and hours and hours on these networks. And when their favorite influencer or their favorite TikTok video creator or whatever gets fucking deplatformed, that hits them. It hits them very hard, and it, it's it's something they can relate to very easily. And I think there's a broader discussion about social media addiction that we could have, and I don't pretend to be an expert in that field, except people should use it less, and I try and practice what I preach and use it less. Um, but I, th- I think the Noster cell is an easier cell that people will come to grips with very quickly quickly as the censorship increases and and we'll see on this next election cycle that's usually it's usually around the hot button stuff we saw massive censorship during covid um turkey was like elon's first test and what was it it was turkish elections right so the politics tends to he would have had to have broken the law or you could have just not had twitter there um by the way nostra was completely unaffected during that whole thing right Mm -hmm. so um i think as people get censored they will they will start to realize um, and they'll come over. And the interesting thing is 
because Nostar has Bitcoin payments built in, I actually think Bitcoin becomes, I, I think Nostar could onboard billions of people into Bitcoin, like where they're first, I mean, right now, you know, do we wish there was more daily active users of Nostar? That site I was saying, uh, Nostar.band, puts it out like 12,000, 14,000 daily active users um, on Nostar right now. Um, it spiked when the Twitter rate limiting happened and they closed everything behind login walls. Um, should there be more? Yeah, I, I wish there was more, but it's still very early in the adoption cycle. But where I'm going with this? I'm going with this is if you reply to one of my posts on Nostar, and you haven't set up a Bitcoin Lightning address, like you're leaving sats on the table. Like the other person who comments who has a Bitcoin Lightning address set up, he's going to get paid some sats for me, um, but but you don't. And so then all of a sudden you're like, fuck, what is this Bitcoin thing? Let me figure it out. It's not onboarding onto a KYC exchange. It's not taking your hard-earned money and putting it on. It's just internet money that can't be easily blocked, that if you post on this social media site, you might get some. And I, I, I think it's a very low lift uh, touch point, like first touch point for people to, to experience Bitcoin. So I actually think Nostr will be an adoption accelerator for Bitcoin and, and might actually be adopted at scale. It, it, obviously it's way less adopted than Bitcoin right now. It might surpass Bitcoin in adoption and then start pushing people into Bitcoin. It might be the opposite just because people are so ingrained with social media. They live on social media now. But it also makes sense in that there is still that initial conversation. I get it all the time. People are like, I want to buy Bitcoin. Am I too late? When's the best time to buy? But you don't have that conversation if you're just getting it on a, on a post. Yeah, exactly. That's the point I'm making. It's like Bitcoin, the first time you get into Bitcoin, there's always that choice. It's like, Am I going to lose some money here or I'm too late? That kind of thing. With Nostra, it's just like, oh, it's another social network. I'll try. There's no, no it's like this guy Odell just like gave me 2,000 sats. Like, what the fuck are these things? Yeah, you but know? even pre, pre, like, pre that, what I'm saying is the, the, the reason Nostra might accelerate ahead of Bitcoin is the choice of using it is a choice of just signing up to a platform. Whereas Bitcoin, you've got to make a financial choice. Do we want to part with some money and potentially lose exactly. it? Exactly. So I just think I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Let's talk. Let's. Um, and if you got anything else you want to say on that, uh, let's. Well, Danny seemed like he was going to say something. No, I mean, I've been thinking a few things, but I think the thing that's going to be hard is when people realize that they aren't the products on something like Nostar, getting people to start spending money, like buying things at the true value of that content. That's a whole different question. It is, but the, um, those content creators that get banned from Twitter or YouTube or wherever it is and end up on something like Nostar, like they have to make money. And so to do that, they have to find revenue somewhere. And so those people who are no longer the product on something like Twitter then have to start spending their money. Well, so so look, I, I think this is separate from the value for value discussion and we've had this discussion in the past. Um, but it's it's all part of but, the same no, thing. No, but my point is, my point is, is like, so right now on, on Twitter or Instagram, everything except YouTube. Yeah. You don't, content creators don't get a cut of the ad deals, even though, Ads are the majority of their revenue. What do they do? They like they put their ads in their podcast. They put the ads on the bottom of their newsletter. They put the ads in the video content, right? Uh, Nostra doesn't remove any of that. Like if you're a content creator or independent journalist or whatever you want to call yourself, uh, you can still release a video on Nostra that has Without sponsorships, it. right? You just have this other avenue where your audience can send you Bitcoin directly and you can send your audience Bitcoin directly. They share something, you can send the Bitcoin. And and that's very interesting because it's not an all or nothing. And I, I don't think value, uh, we've talked about, I think value for value is quite compelling and gives creators a lot of independence. Um, but we've both, all three of us have agreed in the past, both privately and publicly, um, that the revenue levels are way, 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 way less than ad-based revenue. And that's why people choose ad-based revenue. Um, but it's separate from just content creators. So like there was this woman, and no one can verify any of this. I forget where she said she lived, maybe Venezuela. And she's like, she's on Nostra and she posted it. And she's like, my mother, uh, my mother's sick. Uh, we basically live, you know, paycheck to paycheck on fucking nothing. And, you know, she wrote like this whole story of, of, about her life or whatever. And then people just started 
sending Bitcoin to her. And she didn't have to separately ask for Bitcoin. I mean, some people, especially like more uh, negative people could just assume that it was a ask. It was a post She's that was asking, asking anyway. for Bitcoin, but she didn't have to enable anything special. The, pl- the protocol natively allowed her to accept Bitcoin. And another key is the protocol, the way it's set up is if you send Bitcoin, your little badge, your little profile picture in your name says how much you sent. So people love the social signal, mm. right? It's like, Oh, it's like, oh, Peter sent her 100,000 sats, but did you see Odell sent her 250,000 sats? And it's just all built in right there. So you have this this censorship-resistant protocol that can replace pretty much any social network, and then you integrate a censorship-resistant money directly into it with the social signaling of your network graph or you know the people that you're connected to and who's doing what. And all of a sudden, you have a very powerful platform killer that is very much in its infancy. It's, you know, it's like less than two years old now or something like that. I, I think people are really underestimating um, how quickly something like that can grow. I mean, I'm, I really hope it's successful. I, I'm optimistic, but a lot of it is just based in hope. Like a lot of the conviction is based in hope because the alternative is just incredibly dark. Are you using Nostra much? Yeah, so to practice what I preach, because a lot of people have said... Uh, if you're so upset with Twitter, like, why are you still using it? Um, for the last eight days, I was using Nostr only and, and no Twitter. Um, today, I made a statement on Twitter because of that Anon's Elon comment. And everyone was just dragging me on Twitter and sending me um, private mess. I was getting signal messages. Like, Odell, you were wrong. You know, all this shit. So I just had to be like. Well, that comment says fuck all. He says they'll be protected. It doesn't say He's anything. like, we're going to protect the Anons or yeah. whatever. So I just made How? one statement today. But I'm trying to use Nost- – my focus has I've, – I've, for years, I've had a very strong focus on Bitcoin. And that focus will continue. But more and more of my time and energy is going to be focused on growing Nostr and helping it become more robust. Um, OpenSats, the nonprofit uh, that I co-founded with Ben Price, um, now has a Nostr fund. We just funded 16 Nostr open source projects. 1031, where I'm a managing partner, the venture fund is is going to be funding Nostr focused startups. Um, and Bitcoin Park is all the podcasts will focus on Nostr more um, tangentially and and also directly. Uh, our rabbit hole recap, like we cover Nostr news alongside Bitcoin news now. Sill Dispatch, I'm going to have more and more Nostr focused shows, uh, including this Wednesday with the founder of Primal, which is one of the most promising Nostr clients. And then Bitcoin Park is going to focus on Nostr more. Um, we run our own relay for our members. Um, and uh, they're able to get it at BitcoinPark.com uh, handle. Uh, so like uh, well, we, if you're Harry, you have Harry at BitcoinPark.com. And then when people want to search on Nostr, they can search for you at, at BitcoinPark.com. So more and more of my focus is going to be on growing Nostr and making it more robust because I think is an incredibly complimentary freedom tech tool with Bitcoin. And I just don't think people really are appreciating, you know, what the centralized control and capture of these um, communication platforms is really doing for our society. Like it is so negative and just people are not appreciating the scope of it. We've got Will from Damas coming on the show. Fuck yeah. Yeah. He's not flying into Nashville, right? I don't know where he is. Just Vanessa messaged me and was yeah. like, yeah, fuck, we'll do it. Oh, awesome. I don't know where he is. Let's not talk to him if we. But don't. my point is, he's not flying in this week. To okay, yeah, but no, no, it's not this week. I, this like this is, is the first I've heard of it. Yeah, too. <laughs> the, Will is a fucking Vanessa legend. For, he's awesome. Yeah, how do we um, help more? What we just we... gave him some funding through OpenSats as well. How do we help more? Um, and you mentioned infamous blue check Dor- Jack Dorsey. He donated five million dollars to OpenSats for Nostra projects. Nice. Um, so we maintain complete independence from him. He doesn't have any choice on how we allocate it but uh we're definitely very grateful that he gave us um we're 501c3 tax deductible organization we were just very grateful that he gave us a no strings attached donation to allocate to nostra projects so how do we help more what can we do look i think a very productive thing is to focus on nostra more on your show Mm -hmm. um i think you should resist the check um I think you should resist identity verification on across all platforms as much as possible. And then if you don't resist the check, you should at least 
uh, be talking about uh, the dangers of identity verification across uh, the internet. Um, and I will just reiterate one more time, it's not the payment, it's the identity verification. That is the issue. So if he changed it, he won't. Allowed, but if, just if, if he changed it and allowed you to pay with Bitcoin, pay with Bitcoin, no phone number verification, and it was just literally pay to to join, pay to pay to use Twitter, and only paid users can use it, and maybe non-paid users could use it in view only. Completely respectable decision. Have you seen the um, the gold check? The yeah, company one. Companies, That's the yeah. company you one. You seen how yeah. much it is? No, it's like eleven hundred dollars a month or something. Oh, shit. Right? Yeah, but you get all your employees get blue checks out of it. But if you got like three employees. Do they scale the price depending on how many blue checks no, you get? Uh, how many? No. I think it's a fixed price. How many baby blue checks you get underneath it? Bitcoin magazines, I think, has got that, haven't they? Yeah, Riot just got one because uh, my good friend Gosla, who's head of mining at Riot, made sure to message me that she didn't she didn't get the blue check out of her own volition. Riot blessed Riot blessed her with the blue check. Um, yeah, thousand dollars yeah. a month. Yeah. Plus fifty dollars per month. What why the fuck would you do that? It's a lot of money. Like Mempool are doing it. How why would they spend that money on it? Dude, I mean we the the talk we had about uh influencers um really valuing uh Twitter as a platform and not wanting to get knocked off of it or lose reach on it, like it is very true for companies. Like some of these companies, it's their main marketing funnel, it's their main top line funnel for customers and it's the way they interact with everybody and elon knows that he's got he's got most people by the balls yeah and like i say I, what i've been really disappointed with is the lack of pushback there's no pushback elon. elon to the point where like it, at least in the bitcoin community it's mostly just a meme it's like odell just <laughs> talking shit about blue checks yeah. like it shouldn't be well i think he's gaslighting people into thinking he cares about freedom he cares about free speech. Wait, he, he's really, it was fucking clever. Like, people don't realize, like, it, I, I have respect for his lack of ethics and execution in this regard. Like, he, when, 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 the, when the blue check concerns were first coming up, what was his response every time? Pay the $8. Mm -hmm. The payment is not the fucked up part. But he made sure that was the conversation. If he had just said to people, there would have been way more pushback if he had said to people, verify your identity and we won't shadow ban you. No one would have fucking done it. A lot of the Bitcoiners wouldn't have done it at least. A lot of like the freedom oriented uh, types wouldn't have fucking done it. Do you think but when he said, oh, you're paying for it, like for whatever reason, it's just like it makes it just removes the identity verification from the conversation. It's like, oh, I'm paying for the reach. Do you think that's malice or do you think that's just like an unintended consequence? I think it, I think he knew exactly what he was doing. But there is this. Uh, I don't know how you refer to them. Uh, let's call it the uh, intellectual dark web 2.0. There's this group of people. There's Rogan. There's Tim Paul. Yeah. There's Jordan Peterson, just blue check, Zub blue check, blue check, Zuby, they're blue check. A group of people who are highly respected, seen as people who will challenge yeah. the status quo, all comply, ch challenge authority. But no, but he's become he's like in their friend circle. Yeah, like because, he's done all their podcasts. Because if if they don't, they might lose their audience, or they might lose him as a guest on their shows. But both, they have to play ball. But do they have to? Why aren't, why are they? I don't know. Maybe they haven't thought it through like you have thought it through. That's, that's the point I'm making, like I made earlier. Like maybe Glenn Greenwald hasn't thought it through like that. All your heroes. I know Jordan has. All your heroes are captured. Most of them are LARPs. Do not blindly trust me or anyone else, but you have to view it from that lens. Like that is, that is how you have to view it. They're all fucking captured. Tim Paul was captured a long time ago. Yeah, well, they're all fucking captured. And and it's actually really convenient because Twitter has this new feature where if they have a blue check next to their name, you know for sure they're compromised. <laughs> like I say, I think some of them unknowingly are. The fact that Snowden's got a blue check. Yeah, the snow, so, so bad. That is a surprise. And he even spoke out against... Uh, He's been using Nostra more often. Yeah, and he spoke out, was it the rate limits? Yes. He spoke the other week. Because he uses Knitter and other clients to view Twitter without being logged in, which is much better for your privacy, and that all got blocked. Yeah, you can't you can't see the tweets of people who block you now. 
So you get the notification right. and then like, uh, and then you go, you know, you copy the URL, you, you know, go in incognito mode. You just can't see the tweet. That's like it, actually like annoying. It, he rolled that back. So now you can. Oh, you can. And the big thing that it really also broke was the like previews. If you like posted it in Signal or Telegram or Slack, it wouldn't show the Twitter preview because the fucking bot's not logged in that's showing the preview. Um, so he did roll that back, but I think I think he it, it gets rolled rolled back or whatever. Like it's going to happen again. That's the plan because, um, yeah, it's because he wants to close the API. He wants to charge people for the API, and otherwise, it's just going to keep getting scraped on that side. So he's going to close up the whole the whole thing. And I think that's mostly um, he's just making sure his like servers are are ready to go and he can handle all the login requests. He is running the risk of making so many drastic changes that he just gets to the point where people are just like, oh, just, they just not even make a, uh, a rational judgment to leave. They just use it less. Like I, I use Twitter a lot less these days. I just well, do. We're also like in like the summer doldrums. I think people use Twitter less right now. Um, but that's also like why, you know, all the different psyops are important. Like he has, he has, he essentially has like this little psyop factory in Twitter. Um, remember when uh, there was a Russian coup? Like what happened with that? That was like 12, 14 hours of really high Twitter usage that he accelerated through his profile and his personal reach on Twitter, which somehow he has the highest reach on Twitter. <laughs> how, how um, who that? would expect that? Um, and then like, what, like two days later, it was like a nothing burger. Like it didn't fucking matter. That one was really weird. Um, that got promoted so much through Twitter. And that Mario guy, he ran like a 14 hour space. And, and Elon inf- inflated him. He pushed yeah. him up, right? Yeah. Because it's good for business, right? It's good. All these psyops and all this different engagement tactics, bullshit. Just story it's of the all day. good for business, Just right? Like Joe, Jonah Hill this week, and I getting saw. you addicted and keeping you keeping you on the teat, right? And like up until Noster, there was really no alternative. Um, like people, there might be some people listening here that are like really in the weeds that are like, oh, what about like Activity Pub or Mastodon? Like they were all had broken incentives. Like the whole thing was fucking broken. Like Noster is beautifully simple and robust. Um, and the simplicity is is where the beauty lies. And that's what people, a lot of like the shit corners and stuff don't realize about Bitcoin. Like the beauty of Bitcoin is the fucking simplicity of it. Yeah, It's like not like, oh, let's add a million different fucking features. It's like, it's just like simply robust. And, and I see the same thing in Nostr and we finally have an alternative. So as pe- instead of like hopping between centralized platform after centralized platform that all have different shades of the same issue, um, there's actually a free alternative that is, free as in freedom that is being built up and is growing at a very quick pace that like the actual infrastructure is being built out way quicker than the actual active user numbers or anything like that would say well hopefully it becomes cooler as well that people want to use it i think there's a there's a brand issue sometimes these things of yeah people just want the easy sexy cool stuff uh as it becomes easy sexy cool but i think we can make it easy sexy of course. cool i mean it would be helpful with someone like I don't know. Uh, Glenn Grumore did drop his blue check and said, look, I'm going exclusively to Nostra. Yeah. Well, Snowden did that. Yeah. If yeah. you won a few people, or someone like Rogan spoke out against it. I mean, uh, Dorsey did that for a little bit. Yeah. But I've noticed he's gone back to posting mainly on Twitter again. He posts both places. But now. the thing is about, he has, he has an impact on Twitter by... No. raising specific issues. If he replies to Elon, people notice. That's the battle, right. Yeah. So sometimes you have to be on the inside to fight, like Marty says. Don't give Marty the out. Marty's fucking full of shit. <laughs> I love Marty as a brother, but <laughs> it's some blue check cope that's going on over there. Matt, have we, uh, anything you want to speak about that we've not spoken about today? Shill the park, man. I mean, come to Nashville. Come visit us in Nashville, bitcoinpark.com. Um, Good vibes over here. Very strong momentum. We're building something cool here. Come shake her hand. If you don't have a blue check, you come here, shake my hand. I'll give you a no, no bugs, no pod, no blue check hat like I gave to Danny. Uh, if you don't have a blue check. Um, but yeah, come visit us. I think uh, all our links are at bitcoinpark.com. Um, all my links are at odell.xyz. Um, so check that out. 
It's always a pleasure journey. I mean, I guess like this will release and then the What Bitcoin Did Live will release as well. Like, Yeah, I, we, well, we don't know if we'll release the What Bitcoin Did Live one. You're not going to release that? Well, I think, I think the, pro well, it depends. It depends if it's different enough. So like- It's going to be completely different. It's going to be me and Preston. Well, yeah, but it's going to be you two separate and then you two together. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We'll do one, we'll do like half an hour with you, half an hour with Preston, and then get you both together. You got to, if you're not going to release it, I'm out. I mean, we could release it. The only yeah. reason we wouldn't <laughs> is if, if we have the same conversation we have now. We're not going to have the same conversation. I'm not going to have a blue check conversation. We can oh, do it about what this conversation, conversation was meant to be about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like BlackRock ETF, like uh, all that stuff, right? Yeah, I'm, that. I'm teasing the future conversation. All right. <laughs> Just give me a quick take on BlackRock. The BlackRock ETF will happen because BlackRock owns this corrupt world and you never bet against corruption. Um, but Harry Suddock, our mutual friend, would say everything's good for Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think BlackRock can go fuck themselves. I think uh, the beauty of Bitcoin is we cannot stop BlackRock from using Bitcoin, and BlackRock can't stop us from using Bitcoin. Um, but if what you're worried about is like short-term price implications or whatnot. I, th I think this is a very big signaling mechanism to rich people and institutional capital that Bitcoin is here to stay. BlackRock has been super anti-Bitcoin in the past. They're a 10, 11 trillion dollar fund manager. They have tons of assets under management, uh, largest in the world. Uh, they've called Bitcoin a money laundering network in the past. They've called it a Ponzi scheme. Um, and now they're launching an ETF product. So even if they didn't get approved, uh, they basically signaled to that whole class of rich people uh, and institutional capital that Bitcoin is here to stay and it's a real asset worth paying attention to. And I think the price um, will react accordingly to that. I think uh, ultimately, I believe that you know Bitcoin will in in increase in purchasing power with adoption, whether that purchasing power is measured in dollars or cows or ammo. Uh, or bread, you can measure it in whatever the fuck you want to. Uh, it's a scarce asset. As more people adopt it, the purchasing power should increase. And and if the largest asset manager in the world is signaling that they want to be a part of that accumulation strategy, um, should increase the purchasing power. I think it's a paradigm shift. I think people aren't really truly appreciating how big it big it is how big of a deal it is even though blackrock like i said can go fuck themselves well so the interesting thing of that and we'll end with this because we should discuss it more tomorrow night uh somebody posted something that was interesting i think they're uh what they've noticed they're wrong about somebody posted up a bunch of articles that appeared in forbes and they said oh look of all these positive articles since blackrock you know, positive bitcoin articles since blackrock of uh signaled about Bitcoin. I think they're wrong because I think Forbes are already pretty positive at times. They're a mixed yeah. bag. But they have like this contributor model yeah. or whatever that like mostly rewards people for being positive. But I actually think it's a future prediction. I think the BlackRock thing will lead to more positive stories or more accurate stories about Bitcoin. Because BlackRock owns everything. Exactly. So you might get New York Times now actually doing proper journalistic work with regards to Bitcoin. And so that's a good thing. If we stop with all the FUD mainstream bullshit, if that comes off that, that is a, a, like a very important positive. So it goes back to it. the same thing we were talking about earlier, where like the incentives are set up in a way um, that Bitcoin expects participants to act greedy and selfish. Hmm. Um, they don't expect like Bitcoin becomes more robust um, the more selfish actors come into Bitcoin rather than less robust and expecting benevolence. Um, and, and, and this is what we're seeing essentially play out in real time. Like BlackRock, um, has more to gain, uh, participating in the Bitcoin ecosystem and, and, and launching Bitcoin products than they do ignoring it or going against it. Um, and they're going to play this game and a bunch of other people are going to play the game. And I, I think, uh, the, the main risks that people talk about, the two main risks are, uh, paper Bitcoin. They might play a paper Bitcoin game. I think uh, if you play a paper Bitcoin game, you will eventually get blown out. Uh, we saw that happen to Celsius. We saw that happen to FTX. We saw that happen to BlockFi. We saw that happen to Barry Silbert. Um, you play paper Bitcoin games, people will just continuously take Bitcoin off the market, hold it in self-custody, uh, exchange it in a circular economy. Purchasing power will go up. You will get blown out eventually. Um, 
So to me, that's more of a short-term price volatility risk. It's like, if they want to play paper Bitcoin games, it'll suck for people that are invested in the ETF that is not actually backed by as much Bitcoin as they say it is, but the Bitcoin network will be completely unaffected. And the second thing is this, this fork risk um, of BlackRock having a significant amount of Bitcoin under their management and getting to decide if there's a Bitcoin fork, uh, which, which fork they take. Because the way Bitcoin works is if you hold Bitcoin keys and there is a fork, essentially a code change, um, all the history at the point of the fork is the same. But going forward, you essentially have uh, equivalent amounts on both chains and it's two different chains. So you, if you hold 10 Bitcoin at the time of fork, you have 10 Bitcoin and then 10 forked Bitcoin. And BlackRock can choose if that forked Bitcoin is the Bitcoin that they honor for their investors that that hold money with them. I think we know how that would work out though. Exactly, it'll be yeah. incredibly painful for anyone who's an investor in BlackRock, um, in the BlackRock ETF or whatever their fund products are. But uh, I think it's not a true risk to Bitcoin because the whole point of Bitcoin is that it's incredibly hard to change by default. Um, and uh, if, you, if you try and enact your will on the Bitcoin, you probably will learn a very expensive lesson. So uh, I'm not really concerned about those two risk factors. I think people shouldn't buy the BlackRock ETF. I think they should learn how to hold self-custody and buy Bitcoin themselves. Um, you know, most, a lot of people will not listen to that and just buy the BlackRock ETF. But uh, overwhelmingly, I think it's a massive paradigm shift. People just do not realize the significance yet. Yes. Right. We will talk about that more tomorrow night. Looking forward to getting down to bit. Which we're going to release on the podcast feed. We, well, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to say the only reason I wouldn't have is that we've had it before where we've done a live show and it's pretty much the same show, but it's like, well, no we're going to make sure it. one of the things we take a lot of pride with at the park is that the uh, in person uh, event recording in our event space is a very high quality recording, too. Mm -hmm. So, like, you won't have to worry about the audio quality being poor. Yeah, we'll get out um, Listen, for the release. We're big fans of Bitcoin Park. Cheers to We that. love what you're doing. Love what Rod's doing. Love you, Matt. Thank you. We will see you down there tomorrow night.